All right, welcome everyone. Our agenda for tonight will begin with a brief introduction to Zoom, followed by Dr. Kathy Evans introducing our topic and the guest speaker. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, which will be moderated by Dr. Evans. After the Q&A portion has concluded, I will share a few announcements related to the Zare Institute and the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, and then the webinar will be closed out with remarks provided by Dr. Evans. We encourage you to stay for as much of the webinar as you can, but please know that there will be a recording of this webinar posted on the Zare Institute's website and YouTube channel by early next week if you'd like to watch it again or share it with others. Just a brief disclaimer, we do have a secure platform, but in case of disruption, please do not attempt to exit Zoom. Instead, close your laptop or turn off your device immediately. If this happens, we will resume the webinar again after 10 minutes. For today's webinar, please acquaint yourself with the Q&A button and dialog box that pops up with it. Dr. Evans will be using that feature to moderate the Q&A portion after the presentation. You will likely see a raise hand feature, but please do not use that as we will not be able to monitor it during the webinar. If you're having a technical issue, please feel free to send a message to me using the chat box. So again, please use the Q&A button and dialog box to ask questions of the presenter, and please use the chat feature to ask any questions regarding the technology or your viewer experience. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Now I'm going to pass to Dr. Evans to introduce our presenter. Thank you so much, Maggie. I'm so excited about being here with Dr. Rambagat tonight. Uh, Dr. Rambagat is an educator, an artist, a peacemaker, and a community healer. He's been teaching and transforming communities for over 35 years. He himself, a lifelong learner and teacher, Ram taught biology for over 30 years. He continues to educate about culturally responsive teaching, pedagogy, responsive um, uh, peacemaking, racial healing, trauma awareness and resilience, mindfulness, music, and a hundred other things. Um, in the early 1990s, uh, Ram co-founded Drums No Guns, and uh, yet two decades later, the no, Drums No Guns Foundation continues to support the work that Dr. Bagat is doing in communities with youth and families. Currently, Dr. Bagat is serving as the manager of school culture and climate strategy for the Richmond Public Schools. His primary role is to envision, design, implement, and evaluate trauma responsive practices and restorative justice practices throughout the division. He is committed to working with school leaders and community partners on an emergent strategy for equitable and just learning environments for all students. His efforts are centered around healing community with rhythm, transforming in-school suspension to a system of in-school sports and decreasing uh, exclusionary discipline practices. Dr. Bagat received his doctorate in educational leadership from VCU, where he concentrated on school diversity. His other areas of expertise include conflict resolution, arts integration, restorative justice and education, trauma responsive schools. He is an adjunct professor with the Graduate Teacher Education Program at Eastern Mennonite University, certified trainer in the Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience for the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding. And tonight, Dr. Bagat is going to share with us a bit about his unique approach to trauma healing and restorative practices called Massive Resilience. Dr. Bagat, Ram, Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Kathy, and it's an honor to be here with you. I'm gonna um, go ahead and share my screen and then go ahead and get started. Yes, so definitely it's an honor to be here with you. It's an honor to be you know, part of uh, this community. Um, I'm grateful for all of the relationships that I've developed at EMU and the Center for Justice and Peace Building. And, um, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. I love this format. We're just gonna give kind of a brief overview of kind of the background of how massive resilience emerged and um, just really engage in a conversation with you and 
elaborate a little bit more on the theory and practice through questions and answers. So uh, first I'd like to um, tell everybody that my name is Ram Bagat and I was born in New Haven, Connecticut um, to uh, Lester Ozell Gooding and Lucy Angeli Jones. Um, my grandparents on my father's side, Esther Gooding and Ozell Gooding and my grandparents on my mom's side, um, Marjorie Jones and Roland N. Jones. I didn't, I didn't um, have a, I never met my mom's mom. She died when um, I think, no, nah, I, was, I was thinking maybe my mom was pregnant with me when she passed, but it was before, she passed before my mom um, was pregnant with me. My mom had me when she was 17. Um, I'm not really um, sure of my family tree. Like I can't really just like go down the lineage, but I do have a cousin who has documented our family tree. I, I am aware through African ancestry um, uh, DNA that uh, my, my maternal grandmother's lineage is, was traced back to the Temne people of Sierra Leone. And that really resonated with me because I, like I said, I grew up in New Haven and some of you may know that New Haven, Connecticut was the, the site where uh, Joseph Sinke and the La Amistad Africans were held. Um, and um, that's, that's, that was kind of the site of their landmark case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. My paternal grandfather's lineage is traced to the Kota people of Gabon. So I say that because it's really uh, uplifting to be able to pinpoint where my African ancestry um, originated. I acknowledge my ancestors. I accept responsibility for learning and knowing the names of the Aboriginal people of this land through the arts and activism methodology of the Conciliation Lab. This is a organization that just birthed this new name it's it's the it's the uh, merger of the conciliation project and the theater lab, and so we just gave birth to this new organization called the Conciliation Lab, and part of our um, focus is going to be making sure that we continue to lift up and acknowledge the um, the native people of Virginia, um, upon whose land we stand. And I'm committed personally to make amends for my own harms with the guidance and support of my mother who has transitioned. I wanna call out her name, Lucy Angeli Gooding and my brother, uh, Lester Michael Gooding who have transcended this physical plane. And I also want to um, acknowledge my spiritual teacher, Dr. Janishwa Upadhyay Ashe. So I, I moved here from Connecticut to attend college many, 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 many years ago. When I finished undergraduate school, um, that's a whole story, just my journey through undergraduate school and changed my majors like several times and ultimately ending up majoring in something I never thought I would major in, microbiology. My heart led me to New Orleans for graduate school at Tulane University School for Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And Kathy, we will talk about that, what you asked me before, okay? We will talk about that. Um, however, my spirit guided me back home to connect with my younger brother, I would say just in time. After um, reconnecting with him after three years, because I was in undergrad and I went to grad school, he was in the service, our paths connected when my spirit led me back to New Haven. Um, my brother died from a bullet, a gunshot wound, and we never found out who's responsible. 
his life and death continue to inspire me. So this is a picture of, of my mom. And uh, I had to tell my mother that my brother um, died. She, she was on a trip in California. It's a, it's a story that I would, I would love to share and go into um, when we have more time, like in another situation. But I bring, I bring, I bring this up here because so I had to tell my mother that um, her son was dead. And the way that it, it went down is I had to pick her up. The way that it went down is the day that, the morning that I found out that my, me and my sister found out that my brother died, um, I was scheduled to go pick my mother up from the airport. And she didn't even know that my brother was, um, she didn't know anything that was going on with him. So I, I had to pick her up from the airport. And as we were driving home, well, I actually, before, we, before I went to pick her up, um, you know, I, I told my father, my father had come by the house. I told my father, told uh, my aunts, because we were all worried, like where was he, what was going on with him? And my grandfather um, came by and so I broke down in my grandfather's arms right before I went to go pick my mother up. Everyone else was, you know, you can imagine what it's like to have to relay that kind of information or to go through some kind of experience like that because, um, I mean, it's, it's just, it's beyond words really. Um, and it happens too often. It happens too often. That actually was my, uh, healing agent and driving force for establishing drums, no guns. So I had to go pick my mom up. And as we were driving home, she started asking me questions and she asked me about my brother. And then, you know, I didn't know what to say. And then when I finally told her, um, I'll never forget the scream. I call it the primal scream. And later on, we talked about it. And she said that you know, in one of our intimate conversations at, during our grieving period, which, I mean, that goes on and on and on. She said that she knew he had to be in a better place because the only other time she felt that kind of deep heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching pain was when she gave birth to him. So I bring that up to bring the point of how um, stereotypes and uh, misrepresentations is part of this idea of mass resilience and how um, the black mother is stereotype, stereotyped and denigrated. And I just wanna lift up the single mothers. My mom was a single mom, you know, her and my father um, uh, split up, divorced. And so she was the, a primary influence in my life. And so when we look at or, or you know, hear reports about the single mother, the single mother household, or like a lot of times when athletes are interviewed and they, you know, um, almost invariably say that they were raised by their mothers. I, I want, I, like part, part of how I can conceive of something like massive resilience is, tr is looking at what is um, stereotyped or looked down upon, especially in, in, in my community, I look at the strength of it. So I look at the strength of the single mom who, you know, holds down the family. I look at the strength of the black mother who um, are the black woman who's the backbone and the foundation of the society. And I look, look at these four root causes as being um, major factors in the deterioration of the black family and the prevalence of single female headed households. 
for example, the slave trade and the you know, intentional separation of the family and selling children, separating children from their parents, from their mother, um, cultural misorientation, you know, where um, just the disruption of the family uh, system and the family network within, within the African community and the black community and the crack epidemic. There's a, a film called Crack Cocaine Conspiracy and Corruption that I really recommend you see if you haven't seen it, where there's a particular part that shows how the medical system demonized the black mother and, and um, cut a deeper wound into the black community and the black family. And then the American justice system and how it's designed to um, separate, break up and uh, serve as sort of this continuous ongoing um, collective trauma in the, in the black community. And there's also um, a book too that talks about the cultural misorientation by Dr. Kobe Cambone. And I'll make sure that um, I give these titles to um, representatives at the Zero Institute so that if people want to, um, to check out these resources, they can. Hi, Ram. Just a quick comment. Uh, we are having some people having trouble hearing you. Can you speak up just a little bit more? Sure. Thank you. So, ma massive resilience is, um, I think, when I when I when I think about just my experiences in schools, and I think about being in Virginia, the um, the ground zero for so many of the injustices that um, caused disproportional um, school discipline practices, in youth incarceration rates. For Virginia is, is like the ground zero for, for this. Um, this is where, you know, the first colony was set up that resulted in the genocide of Native, Native Americans. It's where the first recorded um, forced importation of Africans um, occurred. It's the second largest uh, slave port in the, in the country after New Orleans, and, and also the birthplace of massive resistance, which was a response by the Virginia legislature to Brown versus Board of Education, which um, required schools to integrate with all deliberate speed. However, in Virginia, the response was to um, shut down the schools rather than integrate the schools. So this idea of massive resilience came to me when I was listening to a, a, a program, I was listening to a story on national public radio and it was about massive resistance. And I was thinking about all of the, uh, all of the healing work that was going on, like the STAR program at, um, at EMU and healing and rebuilding our communities um, emotional emancipation circles, and, and just like all of the energy around trying to counteract the um, the trauma and the injustices within within our society, and it was like a pearl was just dropped right into my consciousness massive resilience it just popped in and i was and and it just resonated and i knew that this pearl that this was a pearl that was given to me and um 
Now I'm, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more how it's, how it's evolving and how it's developing. So I kind of equate right now the K through 12 public system in America as uh, the door of no return. And what I mean by that is a student entering kindergarten has all of these challenges that are laid out and, and that, that are laid out or that they will um, measurably encounter on their journey through school. They, we, we have, you know, the, the stats, we have the data to show the probability of especially students of color experiencing harm as they move through the K through 12 public school system. So instead of this being a process where you send your child to kindergarten with the expectation and hope that they will go through their educational experience and come out at the other end of the tunnel, they'll come out at the other end of the tunnel, healthy, whole, equipped to thrive. Instead, what happens is there's a process that takes place, right? A process of uh, historical, biological, and environmental characteristics of trauma. There's the historical trauma that's embedded within the educational system based on who the system was really designed for. So from the start, it's exclusionary. It's an exclusionary system for students of color. Biological factors, um, you know, the actual biological impact of, of racism, institutional racism, structural racism that manifests in the curriculum, that manifests in funding, a lack of funding. And then environmental, the environmental factors to where the schools are located, what kind of resources are, are there. So it's almost like, I mean, we call it a pipeline. It's, it's like a pipeline that starts with this uh, deeply rooted racial, uh, sort of racial virus that is embedded into the system that causes urban trauma. And the characteristics of urban trauma are historical, biological, and environmental. And, and then it, it starts to morph into this pipeline, the school to prison pipeline, or the school to prison system that particularly targets black boys. And I mean, we know that research now is showing us that black and brown girls are, are, are also being pushed out of, of, of the educational process. But year after year after year after year, the data is showing us that black boys with IEPs are disproportionately suspended at a high, and excluded at a higher rate than their counterparts. And once we get to that point of in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, expulsion, then we start to see because of this disconnection and the dissociation and the shame and guilt on the part of the students or feeling just alienated, start to see an increase in dropouts. And with an increase in dropouts, there's a direct correlation to an increase in youth incarceration or mass incarceration. So this system is, some people argue that it's doing what it's designed to do. There's a film, I just got finished watching this film called Black Boys. It's, uh, I think it's available through Peacock. This film is amazing because it really shows how society devalues the, um, the black boy's body, the black boy's heart, the black boy's soul, the black boy's mind. And, and we're led to believe this, right? We're led to, 
to um, buy into this portrayal of the black male as a threat. And we, we, we've been witnessing it through social media, especially like during this time where we're, where like our attention is more focused on social media in some cases. Like we've been taught and, 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 and kind of indoctrinated to see the black male as a threat. You know, and there are a lot of references that we can we can um, bring up or that I can share or that you already know. But one excellent source is a book called Brainwashed by Tom Burrell. And then of course there's the new Jim Crow. The new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, where she lays out what I'm talking about. And I'm sure many of you have read that. I don't know if many of you know of this, this book by um, Maisha Akbar called Urban Trauma. That also really explains the, and lays out what I'm talking about. And then another book called We, we, want, more to, we want to Do More Than Survive by Bettina Love. So I'm giving you these, these references because of our time limit so that you can dig deeper into sort of the background and the foundation of, of what I'm talking about. So it's Black History Month, February. Um, many people know that Dr. Carter G. Woodson established Negro History Week, and which was expanded to um, Black History Month. And this quote right here by, by um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, I think, it, it's, I think it's, it's two sides of a coin because for me at, at my first reading of it, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will protest until one is made for his use. His education demands it. So at first reading, I interpreted that as black folks being brainwashed to the point where we're so brainwashed that we will create a back door because we have been conditioned to go through the back door. But I look at it a little differently now just like I look at um, Peggy McIntosh's, uh, the knapsack of, you know, her, 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 her seminal essay on white privilege, I look at it different now. Like, I also think that what Dr. Carter G. Woodson is saying applies to the miseducation of the white man too, or white people. Because white people have also been indoctrinated and put in this box of false superiority of delusion and, 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 and even with Peggy McIntosh's essay, um, it talks about white privilege in a, in a way that I've been working on deconstructing that in, in a sense to where what does that privilege really entitle white people to? You know, like if it's a privilege, that privilege comes at the cost of what? And, are we being oblivious to it? Are we being oblivious to the harm that that privilege um, or that entitlement? And some people argue that there's not even privilege, but we can talk about that in question and answer. So basically what this, what this has in between the lines for me is that we've, we have a misdiagnosis of the problem that the problem that our diagnosis of the problem is wrong. Like, first of all, um, when we're talking about black people, we have to start before Columbus, which was why it was so significant for me to tap into my African ancestry because like one of my interns, actually um, uh, she was an intern, but she's more of a colleague who was in, in um, Unyang at, at, at um, who I met at EMU and STAR program. When I got 
my results back from African ancestry, she's from Korea, South Korea. And she said, that's soul healing. And I listened to what she was saying, that's soul healing. Imagine if every African American, because some, some people, some black people in America don't even identify with their African ancestry. They're like, I'm not African. Imagine if every African American knew exactly where their roots were. She called that soul, that soul healing. So, so first of all, knowing our roots and knowing where we, come, where we came from, that totally negates what we've been told about ourselves, like the intentional changing of names, changing of religion, changing of culture and changing of practices by um, the, the chattel slavery process, the dehumanizing process. So first part of the misdiagnosis of the problem is that um, we, don't have a, we don't have a culture, we don't have an identity. The second part of the misdiagnosis is that chattel slavery was dehumanizing. And not just dehumanizing for the Africans, but dehumanizing for the oppressor as well. Dehumanizing for the oppressor as well and contradictory. Contradictory in the sense that if you consider people to be animals, then why are you engaging in physical uh, acts with animals? So I think that we start to unpack the, um, the diagnosis of the problem. Then law enforcement, third part of this, of, of the misdiagnosis, which is prevalent, which is a major issue right now because the, the essential role of law enforcement was to act as slave patrols, to act as slave patrols. And there are, there's, one, there's a professor at VCU, Dr. Sean Utsi. You can check him out and look, look him up where he really, explains and elaborates and elucidates the roots of the police department. And we just participated in a task force for Richmond called Reimagining Public Safety, where we kind of unpack that. But these, these kinds of conversations and issues need to be had right now, but it's where we find a lot of difficulty having these conversations. And I think the big misdiagnosis comes from the fact that like after 2016 or like 20, 2008 to 2016, we were, I guess a lot of us felt like we were in a post-racial uh, society. We we're in a post-racial society, right? But we found out that we weren't after 2016 because it was almost like a, a recycling of what happened after reconstruction. So there was this, after reconstruction, the country went through post reconstruction and all that that entailed. And after Obama, we went through this post, I don't know the name of it. It was definitely not post racial, but it led to what we're seeing now. And I did hear an amazing analysis where basically this, this um, on one of, uh, I, I forget which, which new show it was, but this, this, um, and this analyst was talking about that, really what's happening is it's the fear, the, the underlying fear that the system, the status quo is falling apart. So people are feeling threatened and they are reacting to that perceived threat or that actual threat of the country becoming uh, less, um, privileged for white people. So I think that what really is kind of foundational for this work I'm doing around massive resilience is that I understand that the United States um, what was an apartheid society. It was like South Africa or it was like Nazi Germany. So I'm not, I'm not deluded by that because that's the kind of education 
at home that I got from my mom and her sisters and her aunts and my cousins. That's the kind of education that I got. It was rooted in that. And there's another, another source that is, I think is very poignant and powerful here. And it's my grandmother's hand where Menachem talks about these three specific areas of, of trauma that we need to focus on if we want, if we want to heal. It's the trauma in the black body or the African body, the, the trauma in the white body and the trauma in the law enforcement body. So when I say the misdiagnosis, I think what it comes down to is that we really have to look at white delusion, white privilege, white oblivion, and white supremacism. And we have to really interrogate that. We have to investigate that. We have to address that. We have to acknowledge um, the historical, biological, and environmental harm that has been caused by this system. We have to accept responsibility as a society. And we have to do some intra racial healing and interracial healing in preparation to come to some type of process on how we can come to an agreement of how we can move forward. And so in my grandmother's hand, Menachem really says that a, a point that really stood out for me is that we have, that we're at a crossroads we're at a crossroads of where we can heal this racialized trauma in our bodies or we can go into post-Trumpism where we don't resolve the issues that came up that, that um, that rose to the surface during the last four years. So the strategy that came through, like the pearl, and that um, I've been doing a tremendous amount of work around in Richmond Public Schools and in Richmond. And it has really um, started to gain traction and started to manifest and starting to embed in, in alternative systems that are evolving. It's called mass resilience. There are four spheres of engagement and that those are the arts, culture, education, and health. And there are these four arcs of engagement, trauma healing, restorative practices, mindfulness, and artfulness. And in these arcs is where I would say over the past at least 10 years, I've investigated, experienced, worked on what are the most culturally relevant models for, or not just models, but methods for those four specific arts. So for example, arcs. So for example, trauma healing. Um, what, what I've discovered in trauma healing is, is a, a combined method that I call a, a shoe. And a shoe is another name for the, um, the deity who opens up the crossroads. So like in Yoruba tradition, you would say Legba, or in the Hindu tradition, you would say Ganesha. And so for me, a shoe, a shoe is emotional emancipation circles. These are intra-racial healing circles for Black people. Um, STAR, strategies for trauma, awareness, and resilience, healing and rebuilding our communities, and urban trauma. For restorative practices, my acronym is DRUM, but really what it refers to our four 
different levels of restorative practice, starting off with community building circles, which we started implementing in every classroom in Richmond Public Schools this school year, community healing circles, which we're gonna to institute next year as we embark on this journey to transform in school suspension. So I'm in the process now of training all of the social workers, all of the behavioral specialists, and all of the student support specialists and community healing circles. And I really base this work on my, my um, experiences and studies with our joy, restorative justice for Oakland youth. And then community conferencing, which I was exposed to in my last semester at CJ, at, um, yes, CJP, community conferencing circles as sort of a tier three intervention and then culturally responsive circles. Under mindfulness, there are four organizations that, there's more than four actually, but the four prominent organizations that I've worked with and whose methodologies I'm synthesizing together, Holistic Life Foundation out of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Yoga for Youth out of Los Angeles, California, Kripalu Yoga in Schools, which comes out of Massachusetts and the Inward Bound Mindfulness Education Program, which is a mindfulness program for youth. And then artfulness, for me, artfulness is kind of like, uh, as you can see, it's between health and arts. But when I, when I think of, I think it's, for me, it's, it represents this merger between the Conciliation Project which is a social justice theater project that was committed to using dramatic, challenging and dramatic arts to bring the conversation to the forefront and to engage people in dialogue in the theater lab. So it's an intersectionality. Um, four organizations that I work with and whose methodologies I'm synthesizing in artfulness are this youth organization in Richmond called Art 180 the Richmond Youth Peace Project, and then of course the Conciliation Lab and the um, Initiatives of Change USA. And so really the goal of this, this strategy is equity, justice, and liberation. And I mean, we could talk for hours about the colonization of the diversity, equity, and inclusion space so I came up with this definition based on my observations at some of the schools, especially the schools that are considered the most underserved schools and how there's so many different organizations coming in to help that it's like a revolving door there. One organization is coming in another organization is coming out. I call it a saturation of good intention so I thought about what equity means in terms of it's more than just having resources. It's like a commitment. It's a commitment to liberation. And that this liberation is based on, you have to love yourself first. You have to be about your own healing first before coming in to try to help someone else. And it's about self-justice. And self-justice is a concept that my older daughter distilled from her work along with me. And really this addresses what happens when, you, when, when, when you're not gonna get um, any kind of response from a perpetrator or from a system. It's more, it's more in the realm of self-determination. And so a concrete way that we might look at this in terms of what's happening right now. And, it, and it's, I have this really complex map that, I, that I'm working on, but um, mindfulness rooms, like establishing mindfulness rooms in schools where mindfulness-based restorative practices are embedded. Transforming in-school suspension into in-school supports. Using urban gardening um, 
as as a as a as a form of engagement for say like students who are on that pathway to to be pushed out like these spaces can serve as a way for that student to reconnect with self or with source or how about when a student does get a suspension and they're returning to the school we just let them come back without doing anything. It's just, you got suspended for five days, 10 days, and you just come back. We're not doing, at least in Richmond Public Schools yet, we're not really doing anything to welcome the students back into the school, to reconnect them back into the school. And then we're, we're also talking about creating this whole ecosystem as students are pushed out, like from out of school suspension to youth incarceration. So kind of pulling off of what Martha Brown talks about in creative, creating restorative schools around relational ecology, really it does come down to what kind of relationships are we fostering? What kind of relationships are we developing in the school? And it leaves, it, it, it really leaves me with a question to ask on the front end which is how are the children? How are the children in your school system? How are the children in your classroom? How are the children in your community? And one example of how we connect and do community building is through this I am the work concept, like Ubuntu, where each person is integral to the collective. Each person, regardless of your experiences, you're more than your trauma. Regardless of your experiences, you can contribute something unique to the collective process. And so this is um, a signature community building process for restorative circles that we call the Junkyard Jam. And one of the, I think one of the amazing things about the Junkyard Jam is that um, it builds trust, it builds interconnection, um, it's non-judgmental and it also is a practice that releases the traumatic energy that's stored in or that's trapped in the body. And um, yeah, it speaks to um, legacy and generation. It speaks to the bullet that took my brother's life has been transformed into um, healing rhythm with community. So I think I went way over time, Kathy, and um, I'll stop there. It's, it's beautiful, Ron. Thank you so much. I do wanna invite people to go to the Q&A and, and ask questions there, um, but I'll, uh, I'll just start out a little bit. I know there's probably some, some folks who are here with us who are in schools that are just beginning to think about um, how we might move this direction. If, like, if you could give some, maybe, because one of the things I know about you and love about you is like you are an, a visionary, right? And so seeing the big picture, um, and so how do people begin to think about what small steps they can do now to begin moving this direction? I think, I think like the small steps start off with like our own mindset. So for a person who is inclined to start to move in this direction, to look at what is like what's manageable, um, what, what, is this, what is your school receptive to? Um, what, what are, what's your capacity and start small. And then at the same time though, back to the question of how are the children, the urgency of this work, um, I feel should compel us to step out of our comfort zone because the long, like Dr. King said, why we can't wait. So the longer that we wait, the more child, the more casualties there are going to be on that school to prison system 
on that school to prison pipeline. So it's like, do we really have the luxury of uh, saying, oh, I think I'll wait next year or two years from now. And another thing is like, what if your children are going through this directly? Like, would you wait? So I think it's important to like, um, commit and, you know, find a way where you can make a difference. Think about I am the work, like what can I do? So start with your classroom, start with reading, start with looking at videos, find what resonates with you. There's going to be a group that is all ready to go. And then there's going to be a group that's sort of okay, we need to learn more. Then there's gonna be a group, I call them the resistors. Like they're, they're just not going to do it. So I don't think we can wait for everybody to buy in. I think if there's 10 people that wanna start, focus on that, on that group. Um, like with our school system, the superintendent came in, convened with community and with other stakeholders and came up with um, a, a strategic plan called Dreams for RPS. And goal number nine is reducing suspensions for all subgroups and priority three is safe, creating safe and loving schools. Action 3.1 is trauma responsive practices and action 3.2 is restorative practices. So all of that looks good and sounds good on paper. When you're working in a school system, it requires a lot of like persistence. It's a marathon and sometimes you have to go around the wall, over the wall, under the wall, through the wall, like water, you know, be like water. But once you get focused on it, just don't let anything stop you because this is the right thing for us to do for our children. So I think we just gotta find out what are the priorities for the district. And if, they're, and if they don't have the priorities, then um, I think we have, to, we have to call them out because as we proclaim to be data-driven, if the data is not driving us to do restorative justice in education, then I think that the data must be driving us to be complicit in the disproportional exclusion of black and brown children from the educational process. So um, we have to take action. We have to take courageous, bold steps. Thanks, Ram. There's a couple of just logistical questions. And so you asked, you talked about uh, Martha Brown's book, and I, I posted that in the, the chat, the link to that. Um, the source of relational ecology, I know that uh, Martha talks about relational ecologies, um, but I would say that there's probably lots of folks who've, who've brought those two words together. Do you want to speak any more about relational ecologies? Yeah, I do, because I, I mean, like we love this metaphor, like what we're doing now is we're looking at like specifically what we can do on the school side of things um, with the knowledge that there are a lot, of, a lot of students that are being pushed out of the educational process and pushed in to the criminal legal process. So one of my partners, um, organizations performing statistics, they've been really trying hard to um, address the, um, the harm that's caused by youth incarceration. So they've come to the point where now they realize we're really not gonna change that system. So now we're talking about redesigning and creating a whole new ecology called the hive, where we create a, where we create an ecosystem that is in support of transformation within the school system and that serves as kind of an incubator for massive resilience. Mm -hmm. 
And at the same time, we're looking at how to integrate youth voice and youth ideas into to creating and designing a system where all of the issues that have been mentioned and all the issues that we know that harm children, that, that we create an ecosystem where that doesn't exist. Mm. So that's, that's another way of how we, we're looking at the ecology of relationships um, established around trust, established around intensive support, case management, mm. um, cross-pollination between this community um, built environment. So not just the concept of building an environment and um, the school system. And so another, another part of it too is talking about a mindfulness room and actually designing a mindfulness room and the students feel it and they walk in and they experience it and the teachers experience it. Um, it starts to transform the energy and then putting in an operation system that's culturally relevant, that's holistic, that's trauma responsive, that's restorative. That's like starting to plant a seed that will germinate. So mm -hmm. ideally we would wanna have mindfulness rooms in every school, restorative urban gardens at every school, have the hive, which is um, this intergenerational design ecosystem based on some of the work that Designing Justice has been doing and um, also harnessing the partnerships of other organizations in Richmond so that we can show that this is what we can do in Richmond, which is ground zero for um, many of the harms that we've seen exacerbated across the country that if this can happen in Richmond, then it could happen in Baltimore. It could mm -hmm. happen in DC. It can happen in Chicago. And it's already happening. It's already happening. So we just, you know, we we focus on what we can do here and, and um, replicate it in other places. Yeah. I appreciate the metaphor of water, like old Winnie the Pooh quote, right? The water, rivers know this, like they're gonna get where they're gonna get regardless, right? Because water flows and it goes around, it goes over, it, it even pushes things down if it has to. Um, and I appreciate that reference there. Um, can I ask you a couple of other questions that are coming in in the Q and A? Yeah. Um, Virginia asks, what suggestions do you have for those training others about these practices and training others to do this work? Well, I think, um, I mean, for me, I just try to learn as much as I can. Um, I practice from the heart. Um, I trust the collective wisdom of the group. Um, and I definitely try to push the envelope. You know, I try to push the envelope um, so, you know, like I meet my, ex I meet my minimum requirements of what's expected from me, but at the same time, it's almost like, a, it's almost like I'm doing this underground work. It's like the underground railroad. So it's, it's like I'm doing the underground work or waiting for when it's the right moment to merge it into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Because like two years ago, um, the things that I'm saying now, they weren't really resonating with, um, they weren't resonating because it was like, Ram, that's all good, that sounds good, but just stay, Just we just want you to focus on getting these community building circles rolled out. You know, so it's like, okay, like that, we can do the community building circles, but it's this large, large, you know, it's this, we, if we really want to make change, then we're going to have to, we're going to have to do all of this. So I think with the training, it's, you know, um, know what you know and what you don't know, and you don't have to know everything. 
um, be prepared, of course. Um, come to your trainings centered. I mean, like do that work before you come so you can hold the space, but also be vulnerable, let people know. Because we have to model what we're talking about. This is not like, um, this is not, you know, like, um, a PD, you know, what you already know, this is not like a PD on uh, uh, this step by step process. So I, I hope that helps. Relatedly, uh, Maureen asks, where do you recommend are some of the best trainings for school leaders in restorative justice? Ooh. Um, EMU. Um, is one place I would go for sure. Um, and then uh, organizations that are doing the work, like that are actually doing the work like Our Joy. Um, I know the superintendent was saying at one, at some point he would like for us to do, make our training available. Um, but, but right now I would say that that EMU for me was a solid starting point. I started with STAR, but then I saw the connection with restorative justice. And they're actually, I mean, they go hand in hand. So that's a time commitment. Um, I don't know, Kathy, I think we had talked about this where we, we need to create something that's not as much of like semester by semester, but mm -hmm. where people can get um, exposed to certain elements of the work in shorter time periods. Yeah, we're having those conversations as well. Um, what does it look like for us to take some of the courses that we offer in three hour formats and, and reduce those time-wise to more of a professional development model? So I, I agree with you there. There's, there's a lot that we could do differently. Um, so yeah. Couple of other questions relatedly. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. One question Thomas asks: How have you navigated creating a restorative space in the in the virtual world? Well, um, I mean, it's difficult to um, like really duplicate what we have experienced face to face. But there's been a lot of innovative and creative things happening. Like we did, we trained all of the um, principals in community building circles. And then they were charged really with um, getting their teachers on board. I felt like there was kind of a flaw in that process because of, you know, of transference. But the teachers have created, um, processes and protocols and, you know, like how to use talk, walk, talking sticks. It's been so long that it's, it's like I'm almost forgetting the word talking stick. Um, centerpieces. And then for me right now, um, after having experienced some phenomenal work in the virtual space, especially like we just, I just completed this project called the Commonwealth and the Common Debt. And it was a community interpretation of, of what the Commonwealth means. We did most of our um, of our work, restorative work, theater work, restorative justice theater work, virtually. And it wasn't until the end where we met face to face for like the recording and everything. It was for the Institute for Contemporary Art. But the but the theater the the um, the theater uh field um their technique and their agency with using this space is phenomenal like mm -hmm. after the uprisings in richmond one of my friends he's a muralist great muralist um started this project called mending walls and so mending walls was basically bringing artists from different backgrounds together to create murals around the city and then to hold dialogues around those, those um, 
those murals. So I, I facilitated that process and I engaged the conciliation project at the time with me. And the way that they created space, like even um, like having people do their own mini murals and stuff like that. So that's that's been a way to navigate the space. And then currently what I'm doing with training the community, training the um, social workers and other members of my department, like, you know, I use breakout rooms, I use, I mean, people are picking it up now too, where it's like, okay, I'm gonna pass to you, pass to you, pass to you, or you, so there, so it's, it's translating into the virtual space, but it has been difficult. The hardest part is like people disengaging. I mean, or they might be disengaging because their screens are off. I know when I turn my screen off at times, I am definitely disengaging because I'm like doing like other things, but um, being able to really feel that the, the energy that comes from face to face but I would say overall, we're at, I might give it a 90%, a 90% effectiveness um, rate because like people are opening and being vulnerable. And, and I guess it's because we're used to the Zoom and Google Meet and all of that now. So progress is definitely being made, but I'll be glad when we can, when, um, we can meet face to face again. Yeah, me too, me too. Um, a quick logistical question, lots of resources that you shared, yay. Um, is that, can that be typed up somewhere um, or uh, is there a resource list that you have at the ready that you have hand to people or is that something we could pull together? We could pull together because I came up with those resources just for today, but okay. we can definitely pull together those resources and- um, I, I tried to keep up with you. What do you think the best the way is for people to who want to get it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Let's think about that. Meanwhile, I got a, I've got about four more questions that are coming okay. into the Q and A. So I'm gonna put these two together. And um, one person asked, "Can you explain a little bit more about the saturation of good intentions?" Okay. And then there's another one. Would you tell us more about what you observed regarding the colonization of the equity, diversity, and inclusion space? Okay, those are two amazing questions. So what I mean by the saturation of good intention is that, I mean, a lot of times people and organizations and funders will come into say a school, for example, right? That is um, identified as an at-risk, high-risk school. Language is never neutral. So we do some work around the language of domination. And so they come in and then they leave. They come in, they leave. Like they're not in the community. They're, they come in and they leave. They're bumping into each other at, as one group comes in, the other group is going out. So they're not there every single day. Um, you know, they're doing, they're doing good work, but it's really not about just doing the good work. Are, are you there for the transformation of the community? So even with the mindfulness thing, that uh, mindfulness room that I have at this particular school I have in mind, um, I developed a, I call it culturally responsive mindfulness orientation so that for mindfulness instructors that wanted to come in and work with the students, they went through a two and a half hour um, process around, you know, just exploring bias, exploring language and how labels are um, oppressive and that it influenced their perception. So the, the idea of saturation of good intention is there's a lot of good people coming in to do good things, but it's like, you're really not there 24 seven. And the other part of that is the people who are there 24 seven, they're doing the work because they, I mean, they have to, but they don't get funding. They, or they have to jump to 15 fire hoops that gets progressively smaller until they get to the, to the goal and they're not getting funded. 
then the colonization of that that goes into the colonization of the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And the best way to kind of explain that is, um, so if I come over to your house for dinner, I'm coming to your table. I'm coming to your space. It's it's how you're going to serve the dinner. If you come over to my house, you're coming over to my space, it's how I'm going to serve the dinner. So it's ironic that now that diversity, equity, and inclusion has become popular, just like uh, uh, there was another term that was starting to become popular. Anyway, as people become woke, then it's like, we still have to go to you to ask for the funding. We still have to go to you and get the training from your framework and ask us, I mean, and then, you know, is, is it, is that the way that we would do it? No, that is definitely not the way we do it. So that's where we're, it's like we're going to the colonizer to learn how to decolonize something that they don't even know how to decolonize. So that's why I call it colonization of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because there's just certain questions that won't even be raised in that space unless we raise it. You know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah. So, um, I mean, we could talk about that in, in different contexts too, like, um, like affinity group, you know, in different affinity groups. I, I usually use um, the male female example as, so what does it look like for me and a group of men holding the space for women to talk about women's issues? I mean, it's possible, but I'm trying to say, like, I, if I'm not deferring, then what's, there's something, there's, like, I'm still occupying the space. I'm still colonizing the space. You should get out the way. You should create, you, like, you should get out the way. If, if it's really equity, then get out the way so that your resource, resources are accessible, but, you know, it's, you don't have to be in control of it. Thanks, Ron. Um, I have an update on the resource list. Uh, you can save the chat. So down in the bottom of the chat, um, those three dots right there, and you can save the chat and that will give you a reference to all the links above. So I have that update. Um, and there's a couple more questions and I think we have time, uh, maybe. We'll see what we can do. The first one is from Warren says, how would you begin to address groups that generally hold views based in upholding the status quo? That is, are there any entry points that have been productive for you in circumstances in which you can sense or predict a collective resistance? Can you describe well, yeah. one of those breakthrough moments? Yes, there's. I can think of two. And the, and the way, I think the best way to do that is through um, heartbeat, through drumming, or through something that is like, okay, we don't even really have to talk about it at first. We're just going to get into a groove. So arts and activism, I think, is a good way to do it. Um, so I, I, I was, I was, um, I was, I was um, doing this workshop on drumming and I didn't know who my audience was gonna be. And so when I got here, it was, it was like all these kind of like, I'm stereotyping here, but I mean, they, they did have motorcycles. It was like uh, Harley Davidson, the Harley Davidson boys and everything. So I'm like, oh my God, like how am I going to connect with them? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm coming in as Ram, God. But once you start telling stories and sharing stories, then that's where you start to get this connection, right? So that has been probably the most effective way for me to connect with mm -hmm. any kind of audience from being on the street corner in Harlem to being at the Yale British Museum of Art. You know, um, I think that's, 
I think that's, I would say that that's my classroom to Congress method. And I need to probably go to Congress and do the junkyard jam with those folks up at Congress for real, for real. Then another, another real hard, I don't really want to call them out, but I, I have to, because we all know it's, it's the school security officers. Like, like how do I reach the school security officers? That is something that was most challenging. And one of the things I think I did, I just like try to use some humor. Uh, my humor is pretty, I mean, it doesn't land that well most of the time, but um, patience and empathy. And then I just kind of rely on my, my teaching skills because I did teach chemistry, Kathy, but I also oh. taught, I mean, I did teach biology. I also taught chemistry. So imagine trying to get people inspired to learn chemistry. So I, I, I developed something called the rhythm of chemical bonding where I used capoeira and salsa to teach uh, covalent and ionic bonding. So creativity, creativity, but really um, kind of listening to other people, um, facilitating in a way where I mean, they test the limits and then they know, just like working with students and they know that, okay, um, I'm gonna be able to be vulnerable in this space. And then one last point on that is um, I stopped trying to put a lot of energy to get buy-in from everybody because a long time ago I had this idea of, so if I work with the people that are already bought in, they're gonna have people that look at them as credible messengers. So they'll reach them. And then those people might be the ones that could reach the people who are off to a distance that I can't reach. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, t we talk about that a good bit. Um, just stop trying to convince the naysayers. They will come along and listen to them because they might actually have some insights that we might be missing, right? Oh, oh I, got, I got a good one. I got a good one. So Dr. Tanya Pettiford Waits, who's my partner in time, she is the artistic director of the Conciliation Project. This is what she says, end quote. I stopped wasting my time and energy trying to convince people that Harriet Tubman would have shot. Boom. Mm -hmm. Boom. Not to, not to advocate violence. No, of course not. It's, it's a metaphor. <laughs> Two more questions real quick. The pandemic has created a collective trauma, but it is, disproportion, mm, dis, it is disproportionately affected our students of color who have less access to resources. How do we bridge from the challenges of the pandemic to a future world where we have a new design? Has the pandemic created the possibility that leaders might be willing to try some new approaches? What do you foresee? I perceive that's what we're working on right now um, with this Racial Equity 2030 grant that we're developing and that idea of the hive and transforming the school to prison pipeline, uh, collaborating in a symbiotic, symbiotic way. Um, whether or not we get the grant, we still have the proposal and that proposal is a bold game-changing mm -hmm. vision that promotes equity and justice on um, an individual to a institution to a structural level. And so, I mean, leaders in Richmond are listening to what we're talking about. We proposed an office for restorative justice as part of our recommendations to the mayor's task force for reimagining public safety. We propose massive resilience. We proposed, um, what else? Com community conferencing. So this is something that is happening. Um, I, I was on a call with folks in Baltimore yesterday. They're talking about it. People in Oakland are talking about it. So I think the pandemic has um, created a wave you know, it's produced a wave of, of creativity. People are doing things in different ways. And as far as the leaders, leaders are listening. 
um, Nancy Pelosi and some of the other congressional leaders uh, went to Ghana and they, their, their trip to Ghana was curated by Dr. Shiro uh, Tawadi Grills, who is the former president of the Association of Black Psychologists, who in conjunction with Community Healing Network um, developed emotional emancipation circles which is an interracial healing process for children of color and for people of color. So massive resilience is about self-justice too. Mm. And so we can't wait. That's right, that's right. Um, there's a question also about, I know your work is primarily right now with K-12 schools in Richmond, um, but what are some of the strategies that you're applying that could also be applied to higher ed um, and specifically, you know, um, in undergraduate college preparation. Would you be able to speak to that at all? Yeah, um, I mean, I also, I also work, do some work in higher ed, but I'm focusing right now on K through 12 in this position. But I think like in higher ed, um, I'll, I'll just use teacher ed prep, prep programs, for example. So we should be doing this work with the teachers before they enter the school district division. Mm -hmm. So I, I always envision like doing, instead of like um, meeting every week for three hours, like let's do weekend, like, like a course like this could be done one weekend a month, you know, yeah. where it's more experiment, it's, yeah, it's more intensively experiential to prepare them to enter into the world with not only the theory, but the praxis. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I don't know, I think that, I think that the, the professors who are teaching the um, theory and the practice sh maybe should, should do more, and they probably do, do more community-based work where they kind of, you know, like the whole community community model, where it kind of breaks down the the um, that artificial. Well, it's not that artificial. It, it breaks down break down that like ivory tower silo barriers. Like you know, I told you I was I grew up in New Haven, and when I was a teenager, we moved to um, a neighborhood that wasn't far from Yale's main campus. Yale is definitely a gated community. And it wasn't until I did a fellowship there that I really was privy to the gated community. So um, I think the more we can do to commute, more we can do around community engagement and not just be like the university that's coming in because we need some subjects to study. Yeah. Um, that, that would be, be really helpful. But you know, providing opportunities for members of the university who have the expertise to offer these experiences to the community, but in a non-hierarchical way, kind of like STAR, like how, you know, STAR is based at a university, but it's, it's also community-based too. Thanks, Ram. And thank you for your time today. It it's been amazing. A um, couple of things that I just want to say, I'm going to pull away and really reflect on more. Um, I want to think more about this sense of urgency that I hear in your voice. Like these are our children and they're not doing okay. And we can't wait around until it's convenient or until it's easy or until it makes sense. We have to work. We have to push hard and vision a, a better future for our children. And I I hear that so deeply and I'm really grateful for that sense of urgency. I also hear in what you're sharing though, a lot of very strategic steps. It's not just having a vision and a sense of urgency, but, but thinking really strategically. And so we appreciate so much just the, the specific and concrete ideas that you've brought with us today. Um, thanks so much for being here and I think, unless you have a last word, I'm going to turn it back over to Maggie. Yeah. Good. Thanks so much, Maggie. Awesome. Thank you both so much.
Um, I do have a few announcements before we close, although I think Dr. Bagot did a better job advertising for CJP than I can. Um, but I do wanna say thank you for joining us today. Um, our next webinar will be March 17th. Please register uh, via the zara-institute.org website. Um, and there will be more information about upcoming webinars on our site. Oops. Sorry, technical difficulties. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so this, the Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, otherwise known as STAR program that Dr. Bagat referenced, um, is a program designed for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. Currently, all STAR trainings are scheduled to meet online. Um, there are two upcoming sessions, uh, a level one and level two, and both of those will be starting in May through the Summer Peace Building Institute. And you can visit emu.edu slash cjp slash star to uh, register and get more information. Hey Maggie, can I, can I say one thing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wanna let everybody know that um, I'm gonna be offering a course during SPI called Building Resilience for um, Challenging Systemic Racism with um, an amazing team of co-facilitators. Awesome, and I'll see if I can put some of that information um, with the recording for this video on YouTube. So I'll try to link that. Um, a couple more announcements. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about restorative justice, we have several opportunities for you to study at Eastern Mennonite University through graduate degrees and certificates such as the RJ Graduate Certificate, which is perfect for working professionals. EMU also offers studies that combine RJ and education or RJE. Um, so students pursuing a master's in education can get a restorative justice in education concentration or similar to the previous slide. Graduate certificates are also available for those interested in RJE. There are also master's degrees in conflict transformation, restorative justice, and the newly added program for transformational leadership. The curriculum is practice-based and ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen field. So for more information, you can visit emu.edu slash cjp slash grad. And last but not least is the Zare Institute website. Um, it's available as a source for upcoming events, uh, resources, the schedule of upcoming we webinars, and a repository for past webinars that are linked to YouTube. So if you're looking for more resources, this would be a great place to start. Um, and the recording of tonight's webinar will be available early next week. So that, that concludes my announcements. Um, back I make one more quick announcement. Ooh. Back over to you. <laughs> this summer, um, the education department offers a restorative justice and education conference. It's the last week in June. And I'll see if I can't pull up the uh, link and add it into the chat. Thanks. All right, is that all? Um, you'll drop it in the chat, I guess. <laughs>